这个要明白吗？这个是一个单纯的思考，就是。Which one microphone is working? I cannot find. I think Elena's microphone is on. We oh, okay, okay. hear some voices in the background. Okay. <laughs> Because I'm in another room, so that we <laughs> we don't have problem with the sound, you know. Okay. Yes. No, I thought uh, it is one of us, but I couldn't find who is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One more minute, and I will start at four or five. Okay, let's just start two minutes. Maybe the other people want to join. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. Okay, I think maybe it is good to start. Okay. Um, okay, hello everyone. Uh, today we are here to uh, start the fifth, I think, uh, PhD talk uh, with presentation by um, Benedetta Fantici, if I pronounce your family name correctly. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, she wants to talk about biomechanics uh, of ocular system. Um, Uh, a bit about her background. Uh, she uh, finished uh, her uh, bachelor and master in biome uh, biomedical engineering from uh, University of Politecnico of Milano. Uh, and uh, she a bit about her interest. She is interested in nonlinear uh, solid mechanics and optic applied to finite element models. Uh, and now uh, she, um, as the ESR 14, uh, is working on her PhD research on patient specific finite element simulation of laser surgeries. So, thank you so much. You can start, Benedetta, and we are thank here you. to listen to you. Thank you, Aura, for the introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm sharing the screen. So, okay, okay. Can you see my screen right? Yes, yes it is visible. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as already anticipated, today's talk will be about the biomechanics of the eye. Just a brief, um, just a few words on today's outline. So. We, I will start talking about a uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental relationship that exists between the eye and the intraocular pressure that is acting inside the eyeball cavity. Then we will see how the cornea is in fact a deformable structure by looking at a small video, a short video. And then we will mainly concentrate on the cornea also because it's my main topic of research. So we will uh, look at the anatomy of the cornea and we will see how can we, we can characterize the corneal tissue behavior by means of a material model. 
And of course, to validate these mature models, we will also have a look to ex vivo experimental tests that can be performed on the corneal tissues, but more in general on the eye, on the tissues that compose the eye. And then we will see, just we will have just a brief look on the importance of finite element models be on uh, in relationship to uh, the biomechanics also because next talk will be uh, exactly on finite element model so of course i won't go into the details of the formulation then uh, we will um, talk about a fundamental step that i don't want to anticipate now but just to tell you uh, that is the computation of the stress-free or zero pressure configuration that must be performed in every finite element simulation and then we will have a look at um, an example of an outcome of a simulation in terms of stress and strain distribution, so from a mechanical point of view. Then we will conclude this talk by trying to answer to this question, are biomechanics and optics considered alone, so separately, enough to comprehensively describe a system like the eye? We will try to answer to this question. So, first of all, I would like, as I said, to start by talking about a fundamental relationship that exists between the eye and the intraocular pressure, the IOP. So, um, as many of you already know, the eye uh, refractive power mainly depends on the cornea, which is the primary refractive surface responsible of two-thirds of the total refractive power of the eye. Why we define the cornea the primary refractive surface? Because if we move from the outer um, part of the eye to the inner part, it is the first surface that interfa is interfaced with, with the air, basically, with the outside, outer world. This means that the change, as many of you already know, if we think about the Snell law, this means that the change in the refractive in the value of the refractive index between the uh, air and the cornea is the highest. That's why the cornea is mainly responsible for uh, the refractive power of the eye. The refractive capacity of the cornea also depends on its shape and more specifically on its curvature. The shape of the cornea is the result of the equilibrium between the biomechanical properties, properties of the corneal tissue and the intraocular pressure acting inside the eye. So when this, when this relationship is not more anymore at the equilibrium, because for instance, the change of the cornea, sorry, the shape of the cornea changes due to the presence of a refractive defect or a pathology, or for instance, the intraocular pressure is not anymore inside the physiological range, pathologies can arise. So just uh, to remind you, each person eye pressure is different. Generally, the range is between 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. When we are outside of this range, range we can have so, some sort of pathologies, like for example, in cases of eye pressure, a glaucoma can appear. So um, now I would like to show you this video because I think that uh, it clearly explain the relationship between the eye and the IOP. This video is, was made by the Oculus, that is the company that all of you know that produces the non-contact tonometer Corvus. So I will show you this video that lasts only a few minutes and then we will comment it. Do you really know what biomechanics is and what it has to do with the cornea? It's actually very simple. Biomechanics describes how biological bodies react to outside forces, for example, pressure. A distinction is made between elastic and viscous properties. Elasticity is the ability of a body to return to its original size and shape after using force, like a spring. The more elastic a body, the better it is at doing this. Stiffness describes how much force is needed to elastically deform a body. This depends on both its composition as well as the amount of material. Viscosity is the resistance against permanent deformation. Viscous bodies can no longer return to their original state or only do so slowly. The cornea is both viscous and elastic which means that it retains its form after being exposed to outside forces and only later returns to its original size and shape. A healthy cornea can do this relatively quickly. It's elastic and stiff. In the case of an ectatic cornea, the biomechanical properties are changed. This leads to increased thinning and bulging of the cornea. 
For example, laser surgery could cause ectasia. The elasticity and stiffness of the cornea therefore have a lot of importance in ophthalmology. For example, in corneal crosslinking, intraocular pressure measurement, or corneal incisions. However, the stiffness of the cornea could never be measured individually until now. Corvus ST from Oculus makes this possible for the first time ever. Pressure is applied to the cornea via an air pump, and a high-speed camera records the change. The Corvus software uses this to calculate a stiffness parameter of the cornea. These data are of particular relevance for screening before refractive laser surgery. In combination with the Pentacam, Corvus ST provides dual safeguarding. Patients at risk with a predisposition for ectasia that can't be detected by corneal geometry measurement alone can be detected by means of corneal stiffness measurement. At the same time, the joint analysis helps in determining if any patient can be operated on safely. On the basis of tomography, some of them would have to be refused surgery due to reasons of safety. Corvus ST therefore helps you to operate on more patients safely and also reduce the risk of an incorrect decision. Oculus. Okay, so um, we just saw in this video basically the importance of on the biomechanics of knowing the biomechanical properties. In this case, we saw it as an application, for example, to uh, choose if we want to perform laser, surg laser surgery. So to understand how much it is important to take into account biomechanical properties, in this case of the cornea, I will present you this, uh, this example. So uh, the algorithms that are of what nowadays are optimized and works um, almost like perfectly well, inside the the laser machines uh, of course are proprietary so they are of, of the property of the company and we do not know them but we know that they derive from the well-known munerlin formula what is wrong with this formula of course the problem with this formula is this is that when it was defined it treated the cornea as it as if it was infinite rigid this means that it's not taking into account the deformability of the cornea. And what does it happen if we don't take into account the deformability of the cornea? Basically, when we perform the surgery, we are making the corneal structure less stiff, so softer. And this is why, why this happened, because we are basically we are cutting a portion from the corneal thickness. So we are reducing the, the thickness and consequently its stiffness. So if you can, if you see here in the bottom uh, video that is uh, moving, when we perform the cut, then we have a upward movement that is due to the fact that the stiffness is, has been reduced. So as you can understand, if we don't take into account the deformability of the cornea, we, of course, we won't obtain the refractive correction that we had planned only with that analytical uh, equation. But um, as we have already seen, the best example where we can see how much cornea is deformable is with the non-contact tonometry test that it measured the deflection amplitude. And uh, um, in this way, we see the more or less the, the quality of the corneal material, that is, if it's softer or stiffer. So, but um, just just go, uh, let's go just to briefly to the anatomy of the cornea. We know that the cornea is made of five la layers, that is the epithelium, the Bowman's membrane, the stroma, the decement membrane, and the endothelium. From a mechanical point of view, the most influent layer is the stroma. So when we want to perform, uh, for example, a finite element simulation uh, or a biomechanical simulation, so we are interested in the biomechanics of the cornea, we can say that from a mechanical point of view, we can neglect the other four layers because their contribution is not uh, very high with respect to the uh, contribution of the stroma to the biomechanics. But how is uh, really uh, composed the stroma? and corneal tissue in general. So there exist many, many different experiments that have 
shown that the, mm, that cornea is characterized by two families of fibers that run orthogonally in the nasal temporal and in inferior superior direction. And then as we move towards the limbus, these fibers start rotating and run circumferentially. Of course, this is just a schematic that was, for example, introduced, presented by Newton and Mick in, in 1998. But with SGH images, it was noticed that it is true that the fibers are perfectly aligned in the posterior third of the corneal thickness. And so in the posterior third, they show an anisotropic behavior. But in the anterior two thirds of the cornea, they show um, the fibers show a more uh, isotropic, a more random distribution. It means that they have a more isotropic uh, behavior. What does this mean? That the randomly uh, the random distribution in the two in the anterior two thirds of the cornea make the cornea stiffer because it creates a sort of a net. And this is confirmed by the, the graph I'm showing you that shows the variation, basically, the, how the values of the stiffness throughout the corneal th thickness. If we consider, the, um, if we take into account the anterior surface as uh, the reference that it has 100% uh, stiffness, the stiffness decreases uh, until we reach the posterior surface where it reaches a value of 10, 20%. So, how could we define um, the behavior of the corneal tissue? We could say that uh, it is can, it can be described as, as a nonlinear hyperelastic behavior. If we look at this curve, we concentrate mostly on the dotted line that is an experimental curve of um, of the result of an inflation test. We can see that we have a first portion that is linear, and then we have a sudden change of slope. And this is the typical nonlinear hyperelastic behavior. So it's not a simple la a linear line. And that's why we cannot treat, of course, the cornea as a linear ma material, of course. So uh, what? why should we consider this curve? Of, co of course, because we need to use this curve to build our material model that will replicate the experimental result. So. I'm going to introduce you um, the most used uh, corneal material model. We won't go into the detail of the details of the formulation because it's not the purpose of today's talk. I just want to transmit to you uh, the importance of um, um, of how the model can replicate, uh, in fact, the behavior the behavior of the corneal tissue. So we can define a strain energy density function that is a sort of an equation that basically describes the curve that we previously saw and also this one that is present here on the right. It is made of two different components, an isotropic component that describes uh, the isotropic behavior of the matrix of the corneal tissue. And in this case, I'm showing you the new UCAN model, but there exist many different models to describe the isotropic behavior of the cornea. And then we see that when the slope change, changes in the graph, it, it means that fibers are starting to work. So in that case, the anisotropic behavior start um, being more prevalent. And so we need a term that describes that behavior. In this case, I and also in my work, I use the Ozaf, a modified Ozaffer Gasserogden model. But what I want you to understand is the importance of the material constants so that are the ones I circled with a with a red circle. So, for example, for the, the isotropic part is mainly controlled by the constant C10 in the case, of course, of the Noyuken model. And it basically, it is the constant that controls the slope of the first portion uh, of the first linear portion. That is, as I told you, the isotropic behavior. Then for uh, um, the anisotropic part, we have two different constants that control the behavior of the fiber, that is the K1 and the K2. They control fiber stiffness and fibers nonlinearity. OK, but um, of course, we could say, OK, we, we have the model, but how can we determine this, this constant? How should I know which is the correct one? Of course, as I showed you before, we need to have an experimental curve. To obtain the experimental curve, 
uh, of course, there exist many different ex vivo experimental tests, and I will um, briefly describe you some of the most uh, used. For example, there exist uniaxial and biaxial tests where a strip of corneal tissue is stretched uh, in, the, in an uniaxial or bi biaxial direction, and the output of this experiment is a stress strain curve that describes the material behavior. Then this curve can be fitted with a model, with a material model, in order to obtain the constant that, that, that replicate this behavior. Then, uh, let me see if it starts. Okay, we have also the inflation test. It consists of inflating with water or air only the cornea or the whole eyeball, depending on the setup of the experiment. And the output is like the graph I have I've just shown you, the intraocular apical rise uh, uh, graph. And then we can have also the indentation test, where an indenter applies a pressure onto the anterior surface of the cornea. All these tests can be replicated with a finite element simulation. In this way, as I told you, we can, of course, obtain the constants for our model in order that we are more or less sure that our model is replicating corneal behavior. So, why we should take into consideration why we should use a finite element model. So, of course, using a finite element model could be, it, it is crucial to analyze the biomechanical behavior of the eye or of specific structure inside it. We can concentrate only on the cornea, on the sclera, because through a finite element model and consequently through a finite element simulation, we can have uh, we can compute stress and strain distributions. And basically, stress and strain distribution tells us how the model is behaving. But we will see an example uh, in a few minutes. Then we can also use a finite element model to replicate and eventually predict the outcome of a surgery, as in my PhD, or a clinical test, as in the contratonometry test, as Elena does in her PhD. And we can also, as I just show you, reproduce experimental tests to validate the models. But before running any simulation, a crucial step must be performed, that is the computation of the stress-free configuration. Okay, so we have to make a step back. And first of all, we have to consider that when we acquire a, a patient-specific geometry, for example, with a topographer, we can um, obtain the anterior and the posterior surface. We must, of course, remember that we are acquiring the geometry in vivo. So this geometry will be already subjected to an intraocular pressure, but we don't know the state of stresses and strains that are acting on the cornea in vivo. So many algorithms have been developed. Uh, here I'm showing you just one, but there exist many others that helps us to compute the so-called stress-free configuration that basically is a smaller geometry that um, we would have if the um, cornea or the uh, eye geometry uh, was not uh, pressurized. So this, once we compute this stress-free configuration and so, uh, we can start our simulation in order that, in order, in order than that, uh, when we come back and we pressurize, we apply the intraocular pressure, we will have the correct distribution in terms of stresses and strain. And this is fundamental to analyze uh, how my simulation is working, how is acting, how is affecting the model and so on. So now I want to show you just an example of a typical outcome of a finite element simulation. In this case, we were simulating smile surgery. For those who don't, don't already know, my smile surgery basically consists in extracting a lenticle from the corneal thickness, so a lenticle of corneal tissue from the corneal thickness. In this case, I chose to show you the displacement, the stress and the strain maps. Because if, for example, if we look at the displacement, we see how the, our geometry is moving. And consequently, if we look at the strain, we, see, we can see where it is mostly deforming. So we can basically analyze its biomechanics. And then it is very important to look also at the stresses, where the stresses are more concentrated, because in this way we can see, for example, that 
smile surgery in this simulation is actually uh, affecting, is concentrating stresses at the posterior surface. So this is a result, this is something that she, we should take into account. So um, we are moving towards the end of today's talk. I want to conclude with two more examples. And uh, we will try to answer the question that I told you at the beginning. So in this first example, this was the work that we presented last year at the ESB Congress. We basically cre created a um, keratoconic uh, model of the cornea. We placed an, irregular, an irregularity at the posterior surface. We lowered the material properties right where the keratoconus was placed. And then we performed PRK surgery. What happened? If we look only at the um, maps of the strain distributions, we can see that at the posterior surface, we have a small concentration of strains right where the keratoconus was placed. But at the anterior surface, we cannot see anything. It seems like the geometry is almost healthy. So if we stopped our analysis only considering the mechanics, we wouldn't have a comprehensive view of the clinical state of this patient. Then, we, if we calculated the mean curvature of the anterior surface in this case. As you can see, the, the pattern of the mean curvature is really asymmetric. So what we couldn't see with the biomechanics, we saw it with the optics. So this is the first example that tells us that these two, uh, let's say these two fields should be always considered together. Another example that I want to show you, is just like a sort of a, a thought, a reasoning. Before performing laser surgery, the surgeons must perform a pre-surgery evaluation where, to, where they have to decide if the patient is eligible, is healthy to, uh, and can receive the surgery. So um, the Corvis, the non-contact tonometry test is performed, the topography is performed, the optical analysis is also performed, and so if the patient is considered healthy, it will, he, will he or she will receive the surgery. But what happens? So the surgery goes well, uh, the patient um, is uh, happy with the final optical outcome of the surgery, but then after a few years, keratoconus appears. This is why, this, that's because we never have to forget that, first of all, cornea, and in general, the eye is, a, is alive, is a um, biological structure that is alive, that has biomechanical properties that we are changing and we are highly um, influencing with our surgery. Why? Because we are cutting a portion from the cornea. So we are changing the stiffness of the cornea. We are changing a bit the equilibrium within the material properties and the intraocular pressure. And so um, it can happen that complications still arise. So what is the take-home message that I want to leave you in this, with this talk? When dealing with a system like the eye, which is both a, a biological structure and an optical lens, it is, it is important to consider both the mechanics and the optics of a system as a whole and not separately. The main limitation nowadays is that mechanical properties of the structure composing the eye are still unknown. And so this is the big, li biggest limitation in reproducing the biomechanical in vivo behavior, but don't worry. Research is moving very fast toward this goal, and I really hope that soon we will find uh, a solution. So thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer if you have any question. Thank you so much, Benedetta, for your attractive presentation. It was very nice. I like that. Thank you. Um, all the videos and everything. So if anyone has any question, you can ask. Okay, so um, Saeed has a question, but he cannot use the microphone. It's not a problem. I cannot connect to the camera, okay? Ah, okay, I have to write. Don't, don't worry, we will wait for your question.
Okay, could you please explain more about page 11 that I don't remember what is? Okay, the zero pressure configuration. So let's wait that I will share again my screen. Okay, can you see it, right? Yes. Okay. At first, this, uh, um, this uh, step could be a bit tricky. It's not that easy to understand, but I, I, I now I'm used to it, so I know it, but I, I can understand that at the beginning it was also hard for me to understand why we should perform this step. So um, let's think about every biological structure. We can apply this uh, uh, step not only where we are considered when we are dealing with the eye, with the cornea, but to we, to um, every biological structure. For example, we will want to um, with digital imaging techniques we acquire the shape of, of an aorta, for example. So when we acquiring a uh, in vivo geometry. This geometry is already pressurized. I mean, sorry, you weren't listening to me, right? Could be. Baura, I, I cannot hear you. You have your, your mic is off. Yes, yes, uh, we were listening. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, okay. I saw, no, I don't know why I saw. Okay. Okay, okay, perfect. So I will continue. So. What I was saying that every biological structure that we acquire by means of digital imaging techniques that in our case, for example, with the topography, we acquire the anterior and the posterior surface. We don't have to forget that these structures are pressurized and we cannot know a priori the distribution of in terms of stresses and strains. So we acquire the geometry with the topography, with the topography. We build our model, but the dimensions of our model correspond to a geometry that has been already pressurized. That's why we need to apply this algorithm so that we can compute a smaller configuration that corresponds to a configuration that we had, we would have if the intraocular pressure in the case of the eye was not applied. In this, case, we, in this case, we are recovering, let's say, the initial stresses and strain distribution so that we can start our simulation. So, for instance, we start from the stress-free configuration, we come back and, and apply the intraocular pressure. So, from a geometrical point of view, we come back to the or initial geometry that we obtained uh, with the digital ima imaging techniques, but the stresses and the strain will be different. So that's why uh, I don't know if I was more clear, uh, if I was clear, but uh, that's why we need to perform these. Uh, this step is, is crucial. Okay. Thanks, Benedict. Uh, as another question, yeah, she's asking, could you please tell us more how you created the keratoconus cornea? Okay, so this was, uh, I will, uh, let me, okay. So just a second that I will show you again the, the presentation. So it was um, this example, okay. Okay, so basically this was a preliminary study that we did la at the end of last year. We basically, this geometry was not patient specific. It was a conic, it was built with the, with the most famous equation of the conic, so the common equation of the conic. And then we basically um, draw, because every uh, all the model was at first, uh, let's say, draw, built, in MATLAB by using a code and defining uh, a point cloud, basically. A point cloud for the anterior surface, a point cloud for the posterior surface. And then this model was, once we created the point cloud surfaces, we meshed and we built the finite element model. But how we created the keratoconus, but we just substituted in a zone the point with a, with a portion of a sphere. And so we created this irregularity. So um, it wasn't more nothing more than than this. So we basically I usually works on the point clouds. I modify the point clouds and then I will build the model 
starting from these point clouds that I built in basically in MATLAB, or you can use Python, whatever uh, language, uh, programming language you want. Okay, Saeed does another quest, another question. Oh, Osna, meanwhile, asked, have you messed it with MATLAB? No, I have a software that is called ANSA. Is uh, we have the we have both the license, so it's a software that is used to for meshing basically. Could you please tell us what kind of contact or boundary condition did you consider on the different layers of the eye? Okay, so. Um, these models that I showed you that were with the cornea and the sclera were the first model I built. And uh, in that case, I applied the symmetrical boundary condition. That is basically the, um, the base of the sclera could move, let's say, in, uh, in the x, y uh, direction, but not in the z that was uh, out of plane, let's say. But then I chose to eliminate the sclera because it, in my opinion, it was adding another uncertainty because as we don't know specifically the mm, properties of the sclera, of the corner, we don't know the ones of the sclera. So I chose to mm, build a finite element model only with the cornea and I analyzed three different boundary conditions. Uh, the a simple fixed boundary condition. So um, what in Abacus is called in in in, in castor, it's like uh, a fixed boundary conditions. Then I analyzed also um, what I call a sliding boundary condition. That is, I allow the movement of the of the cornea just in the radial direction if we define a spherical reference system. So I allow the movement only in the radial direction. And then the other boundary condition that I consider were, were the one with the sclera. From an optical point of view, I honestly didn't see any difference. So what is important in this case in choosing the biomechanical, the boundary condition, what is mostly affected is the mechanics. Of course, there are no um, experiment, enough experimental studies that tells us um, which would be the more appropriate uh, boundary conditions. So me, right now I'm using the sliding one, but it's my choice, let's say. Okay. Between the limbus and the corneal, your model was 3D, right? Yeah, my model was 3D. And uh, I don't have a clear uh, mm, separation between the mm, cornea and the limbus. I only change the direction of the fibers. Okay, so just another question, oh, sorry. Maria, hello Benedetta, thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you, Maria. What kind of corners do you use to obtain the parameters? Um, what do you mean? Uh, what kind of corners I use to obtain the, par the parameters of the model? I, you, do you mean uh, if I use patient-specific cornea or uh, conical cornea or so on? Can you, can you, can you clarify your question? Okay, Osna is asking how you simulated the cut of the cornea. You also in this case, you basically have to draw the your ablation profile. There are many different uh, papers in literature, like the the oldest one is the one that I show you, that is the Munerlin formula. But there are many different papers that um, basically tells you the question that you must follow to draw your ablation surface. And so that once you have draw it, draw, um, drawn it, um, also in this case with a point cloud, you can apply it to your model. Okay, someone is writing. <laughs> is it a patient specific cornea? Okay. So it depends. I um, in the um, example I showed you, uh, the um, there I didn't show you like a, a clear um, validation of the model. But you can apply, uh, you can compute the material parameters for each and average uh, corneal uh, geometry that is a conic or a biconic, 
or also to a patient specific. So it's not a problem, the geometry we are using, but mostly um, you must fit experimental curve, but you can apply the same validation procedure to both conic, biconic and patient specific geometry. Any more questions or doubts? Okay. If anyone doesn't have any questions, uh, thanks for all questions. It was very nice. And thank you so much, Benedetta, for your attractive presentation. Uh, uh, and I think the the next presentation, the next PhD talk is uh, presented by Matteo and Elena um, in next month. I think maybe they uh, they are they are telling us soon. Uh, and fourteen, fourteen of July. Okay, 14th of July, Matt is helping me here. <laughs> okay. That's a question for you. Uh, if you uh, prefer to change the date or uh, the time, for example, uh, in the morning is uh, better for you all, uh, we can change the talk. So let me know. Maybe we can send a poll like, uh, yes. like this time so that everyone can answer. And so it will be easier for everyone to... Yeah. Say when they are available. Thank you. Yeah, I think it is a good choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much and uh, see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.